as we tackle module 14, uh, special attention to the aging population and the movement changes uh, that transpires across all these years. We kick this off with a uh, discussion of the statistics that might, surprise, that might surprise you. As in any discussion of aging, it is inevitable that we are going to discuss the, the physical and motor decrements associated with it. Recall that there's an exercise aging cycle section in an earlier module. Uh, I have moved that discussion in here. It seems proper to discuss this given the age population we are talking about. Finally, in terms of a practical application, being proactive means looking at movements and anticipating uh, possible changes that we can make so that we can prevent falls altogether. Recall that uh, a paradigm that we've been using in terms of the progression of skills across time, we use that metaphor called the mountain of motor development, this time specifically focusing on the oldest age groups, the older adult, and typically at this stage, a characteristic of the behaviors that they exhibit is that of compensation. Important statistics to remember. Falls account for more accidental deaths in the elderly than any other variable. You now understand why a lot of elderly alter their gait patterns because many of them are quite fearful about falling. Of these fallers, 50% never regain functional gait. Think for a minute what that means. Having no functional gait means they're either confined to the bed or to the wheelchair. 53% of falls are due primarily to tripping. There are a lot of implications here. We'll look, we'll look into the detail in a little bit. One last statistic to think about. 50% of those hospitalized with hip fractures typically die within one year. What is so grave about falling and about breaking their hip that actually ultimates to death? Um, we will discuss this in a little bit. Let us start with the skeletal changes associated with aging. Here is a representation of an average um, middle-aged individual and contrast that to a representation of the posture and balance, at least the ones that have bearing on the movement of the elderly. Just in terms of posture, it is clear that the curvature of the back has changed the flexion at the knee, but we'll get to that in a minute. Gravity essentially takes its toll. All the years of weight bearing ends up compressing the intervertebral discs and results in actual loss of st stature. This is not just a matter of perception. They literally lose height as you get older. In a micro scale, this happens to us on a daily basis. We are literally taller in the morning as opposed to the evening. Stretch that time frame through 60, 65, 70, 80 years. You'll understand how much weight bearing has taken its toll. The end effect, if you have less of that mobility of those discs, what is compromised the spinal flexibility. As to postural realignment, uh, one of the modules previously discussed kyphosis. The other one is lordosis. Kyphosis is the curvature of the back, particularly in the shoulder area where the collapse is inward towards the uh, chest. Lordosis and kyphosis, there is a natural curvature to the, to the normal human back. However, as age takes its toll, they tend to be um, exaggerated. Lordosis, on the other hand, is a lower back curvature that, uh, depending on the functional experiences of the individual, this could go one way or the other. Bottom line, though, it is not uh, surprising that a lot of elderly experience lower back pain. There is something to note about the hip and knee flexion. It's not as though they are contracting this um, willfully at this point could be explained by the inflexibility that comes along with age in other words your tendons and your joints are not as flexible 
combine that with the attitude of shuffling. If you recall when we discussed gait, the tendency of the elderly is to shuffle, to stay as low to the ground as possible. And the last bit of information there is to look at the head realignment. We talked about this in gait initiation of the elderly. There is a tendency to initiate gait by jutting the jaw out. The leaning forward initiates the step cycle. Movement and aging. We already thought of these in terms of gait. There is the characteristic slowness in the gait patterns. But what leads to all of this um, idea that they need to slow down? I mean, not only physically in the movement, but literally as a philosophy, there is that uh, point of view that retirement means slowing down. That retirement means you are too old to do anything. It is just as much reality as it is perception. Introducing a new word here, ageism. This is a social bias against the elderly people where we confine them to a few things that they can or cannot do. And this is where the exercise aging cycle enters in the equation. So overall, as far as movement and aging, there is that characteristic slowness, but it is fueled Apart from the physical changes and the postural changes, there is a social element that fuels this idea of them wanting to slow down or having to slow down. In your text, and the next slide here, I am cutting and pasting exactly that figure in the text about exercise and aging cycle. However, it's much better to do this in sequence, or at least in a, in a way that you can really understand what a cycle means. Let's start with age. Age has nowhere to go but up. Unless you have a formula to revert the time-space continuum, age will continually go up. As you age, what happens to your exercise and activity uh, regimen? There is a natural slowing down, as I said. Part of it is physically some parts of the body start to break down. However, can one be reducing exercise, not necessarily at 65 or 80? Are there young people nowadays that are increasing age and are prematurely decreasing exercise and activity? Recall that we talked about the empirical data provided among teenagers in this country. Teenagers in droves are stopping exercise and activity, mostly girls. Although this phenomenon of exercise aging is being discussed in the context of the elderly population, please take note that the mechanism is probably already in place even in young folks like the students in this course. So this feeds back into each other. It's not simply because age drove you to reduce exercise. Could it be possible that young folks who stop exercising and stop being active are also driven to premature aging. That feeling of getting old, that feeling of getting fatter, that feeling or that condition of having high blood pressure, cardiovascular complication, and even that feeling of having more pains, aches and pains. Do all of these contribute to that feeling of being old? On the flip side, as you lower your exercise and activity levels, does your self-esteem take a hit? If there's no drive anymore and you're feeling old and you're reducing exercise, young as you are, this may not be real to you yet, but for the elderly, it's very easy to <clears throat> slide on the slippery slope. Reduce strength, you reduce flexibility, you reduce ultimately skills. And for all of this, think about the principles that we discussed in the module on fitness. The overarching principle there is use it or lose it. And so if you lose it because you have not been using it, that cycle, which, is, which can be very vicious, uh, leads one to a path that's very hard to recover from. Not to say there's no way out of it. How does ageism enter into the picture? Well, ageism is a belief system. It is not the exercise aging cycle. 
Ageism is a belief system that imposes its social bias against the elderly. Just like any isms that we are confronted with on a daily basis. Racism, oligarchism, capitalism, any ism arises from a belief system. So in this case, we are talking about a belief system that confines the elderly into some notion of what they can and cannot do. If you think of what ageism does, it essentially tries to inhibit what certain activities the elderly is supposed to be appropriately doing. There's a perception of inappropriateness. Um, do you expect an 85 year old to still be dancing? Why not? Why should we frown upon a 70 year old coming into the gym and doing bench presses? There is also that reduced expectation for the elderly. Many of us are guilty of this, the way we treat our grandparents. At some point, if you handle your parents with uh, what I call butterfingers. You, when you see your grandma, grandma, stay there. I'll get your drink for you. Grandma, just sit there. I, I, uh, I'll get the, you know, I'll, I'll get the door for you. At some point, if there's an ongoing narrative that they can't do much anymore, when they start believing what you imply in your action, which is essentially a reduction of expectation of what they can or cannot do, Will that have a negative effect on the elderly himself? Bottom line is, at some point, they're going to start believing all of that. And if they start believing that they are good for nothing, the worst possible uh, slippery slope there is they start to disengage. They think if they believe that they're good for nothing, then they start fulfilling their own expectations. In other words, somebody told you that this is only so much you can do you start believing it and you're working your way towards precisely that uh, foregone conclusion in totality ageism exacerbates the prevailing exercise aging cycle that tends to be the norm in our society here though i make a distinction what is the difference between disuse atrophy and aging Aging, by definition, there is a chronological aspect to it. We are aging as we speak because time moves on. However, one can also be aging because of that concept of use it or lose it. This use atrophy is another way of saying that. If you do not use it, that's what disuse means. Atrophy, those of you who know the mechanisms of the muscle, the muscles atrophy or reduce in size if it's not being used those of you who've had a fractured arm and they put it in a cast or they immobilized it in one way once you are relieved of that cast and you look at your emaciated limb you realize what atrophy means literally contraction of the muscle is needed activity use of the muscle is needed to keep its form and tone is this the aging experience as far as you believe it to occur? Or is there an alternative that we can think of in terms of retirement? Uh, a known celebrity once described retirement as a death knell. The idea that uh, most people's notion of retirement is to slow down is actually to make the cycle go even faster. A death knell means it signals your own demise if you start to think that retirement is about slowing down. Based on the exercise aging cycle, it is now more important to think of motor activity and motivation among the elderly. It is a balancing act of quality of life. If the goal is to live in a way that is satisfying, at some point, if movement will allow you to live a healthier life, um, I suggest you pursue that all the way till the end of the lifespan. Remember, this is a course on lifespan motor development. The idea is development occurs all the way through your dying days. One, use it or lose it is one phrase that we've been spouting out. But here is what one person says about exercise. Exercise adds more years to your life and life to your years. 
Not to say you're going to force an elderly to exercise. After all, this is about taking control of your own life. There's no way to force anybody to do something he doesn't like. However, as a way to motivate us, Look closely at this picture. This is uh, this was taken uh, when this man in the picture was 64 years old. There was a follow-up picture of him taken, I believe, uh, when he was 76. Um, the fact that at 76, he basically looks the same, except with a lot more gray hair and a lot more wrinkle in his face and his body. But um, given that it is possible to keep training at 76, uh, in a push-up contest, I will give my money to him compared to betting on a, a freshman at Texas Tech. Who knows? As far as brain fitness, in the end, it is that mind and body connection. Does the brain benefit from exercise, even that of the elderly? Guess what? The consistent research re results show that exercise, if anything, is the mechanism that keeps the brain's is a mechanism that keeps brain cells healthy. Among many other possible modes of um, keeping the brain alive, the one consistent result is exercise. More than word puzzles, more than uh, Sudoku puzzles, more than um, the cognitive exercises that um, people like to engage in, if that's the, the New York Times crossword puzzles. They are useful too. However, think of what that means. Exercise. Essentially, you're guaranteeing that our field as exercise scientists will continue have to have will continue to have a niche, regardless of the age, uh, the lifespan age that we are talking about. Is movement decline inevitable with age? Not necessarily so. Declines observed in strength and speed are likely to be seen. However, the caveat is it is not one is to one in terms of correspondences. Who do I put my money on? If Michael Jordan comes to campus and he, he plays pickup ball with any of our basketball players, who do you put your money on? I ask this question every semester to my students. Michael Jordan is already 52 years as of this time. Very often, college students will put their money on Michael Jordan relative to a, a varsity player with Texas Tech University. It probably doesn't say much about our team right now, but the fact is some people start at such high level of fitness and such high level of performance you do not expect the decline in strength and speed to be precipitous you don't want you don't see that happening a sharp decline for many of us perhaps if you've been sedentary but for people like michael jordan wayne gretzky mario lemieux any of your retired athletes who continue working out and taking care of their bodies my assumption is that one is to one correspondence is not the same as your normal population in fact older adults healthily benefit from exercise and activity in addition adult compensatory mechanisms are known to at least continue on with their survival or continue to um allow the elderly to flourish despite uh, their um, noted slowing down and reduction of strength. What do I mean? This is classically known in motor learning as the speed and accuracy trade-off. The elderly know that they have lost a step or two. The elderly know that they are weakening in some sense one way or the other. So instead of having to deal with everything on a fast pace they literally uh, slow their movements down because not so much they they're doing as slowness for slowness sake the idea is with deliberate action they are going to eliminate errors and if you eliminate errors you're more likely to um, survive you're more likely to experience less uh, accidents if you want to use a metaphor of cars young folks at the prime of their lives you liken them to Ferraris Ferraris are machines designed for speed if you talk about the elderly during their twilight years you liken that to a Nissan Sentra in a snowy day where the roads are slick 
The idea is who reaches point B from point A in keeping with their characteristics. The Ferrari by its very nature will tend to go fast, but who will tend to be found in the ditch and in some accident? On the other hand, with the elderly, the idea is to minimize error and be careful. We will get there in anyhow. You'll be surprised. If you go in the Northwest uh, on a rainy day at the first rain probably of spring, and I've seen this uh, firsthand, literally the road is littered with accidents, cars being stolen, cars on the ditch, you'll find that these cars are the fastest ones, the nicest models of BMW, Mercedes, Audi, uh, didn't quite see a Ferrari. But bottom line, it's the speed and accuracy trade-off. You compensate, remember the term compensatory mechanism. They compensate for the lack of speed with careful motion. Finally, we think in terms of preventing falls. It is important to know the mechanism of falls, tripping. Remember that tripping is the mechanism that's uh, what, about 53% of the falls happen because they trip. If you're going to trip, what are the places in the home that is, that is likely to happen? Uh, floors, stairs, kitchen, and bathroom. These are the most, uh, probably the highest risks of falling occur in any of these rooms. Probably what accounts for the kitchen and the bathroom be being one of the top of the list is because of the construction of the floor, tile most likely. Stairs, obviously the danger is because of the flight involved, but floors depending on the surface. Bottom line, we know that tripping is a huge contributor for, for all the incidences of falls. But think in terms of what you will find in the home of an elderly. If they have a lot of grandchildren, do you expect a lot of toys being left behind all over the place by young kids? And this adds to the risk factor for the elderly. However, there are some built-in risks in there. If you're talking about old homes where there is a discrepancy between surfaces, rugs as opposed to that transition between tile and carpet, edges, what happens if the elderly live with a lot of cords here and there? Uh, the elderly are known for wanting to have uh, electric blankets, and usually it, there's no such thing as Bluetooth electric blankets. They're always tethered, so the risks for all of this increase exponentially with all of these possible clutter that could complicate the scenario. If we are to be invested in reducing fall rates, it is important that we address the visual factors, ad adequate lighting. We also need to have postural support like railings uh, and reflectors on steps. So as far as exercise and activity, here are issues for older adults that think in terms of your grandparents. What is the biggest motivation for a lot of elderly folks in the United States? Typically, you would want to work out with your grandchildren or spend time with them. So a way to motivate in a practical sense, if you want your grandparents to be healthy and to keep charge of their health, it will be a good idea to spend time with them. If that's not possible, how else would you want them to be motivated? Uh, it will take some creativity, but let's start there. Now, another thing that is to be considered for the elderly, because of their inherent fear, that is embedded in the idea of falling, an aspect that cannot be trivialized is their safety and security. Do not expect older adults to be taking walks in the streets, not in the United States, not in main roads where there are cars or bicyclists or motorbikes um, all over town. If you are familiar with the phenomenon called mall walkers, it's a good uh, development even in uh, large towns with a big shopping mall. Nowadays, the shopping malls are opening their doors, not so much the stores, but the mall structure itself so that the elderly can walk around undisturbed and safe because there are not many people walking around at 7.30 in the morning. One is to consider the visual and auditory constraints that the elderly are subjected with on a daily basis. Okay. In other words, if you are going to be a teacher who must work with, with this population, it makes sense that you be articulate and clear in your instructions. And if you're going to demonstrate, it has to be on a large scale basis. 
given that probably vision is not optimal. Secondly, when it comes to auditory sensitivity, let me remind you of uh, what we talked about in the senses. As life comes full circle, the ability to perceive low frequency sound is the function that's left for the elderly. In other words, if you're conducting a class, it doesn't make sense that you're screaming off the top of your voice. But choosing a deliberate tone that's lower in the lower register of your voice is probably you'll be, be you'll be better heard. Give you an example in a case where the elderly um, in a grocery setting, if somebody forgets to take care of a cart and it's about to hit the elderly, what is the best way to, to, to warn them? They're not going to be able to see you clearly, no matter how you warn them. You're not going to be using a tone of voice that will be screaming. They're not going to hear you. And it seems uh, rather... Um, it's, it, it will be kind of odd to hear somebody say, hey, watch out. So voice is not a good medium to do this. With the elderly, and it's, this speaks also to motivation, the fastest sense organ is still skin. So if you're going to warn an elderly individual about uh, impending trouble, best ways to touch them, they'll respond to you, lead them away. Or if we go back to the exercise setting, touch in terms of assurance is something they probably appreciate. They may not see you very well when you're demonstrating, but if you're going to give them kinesthetic feedback through touch, that's a way to go. Overall, you have to allow more time for learning skills. And part of that is allowing them to take it in by giving them short and concise instructions. Um, I'm not sure how much of your generations know who Jack Delane is. He died very recently, but if you're going to talk about the advent of the fitness industry, there's no bigger figure than Jack Delane. Um, look it up. That's a homework. Who is Jack Delane? There's enough YouTube videos about him. But more importantly, what is the lesson learned from his life? He died, I believe, at the age of 96. He was the one who said retirement is a death knell. If what you believe retirement is, is about slowing down and not being active. Lots of lessons from all over the place. Finally, uh, to wrap things up, this is a picture of one of the alumni cheerleaders at Texas Tech. I believe this was in the fall of 2013. This is a 92-year-old cheerleader who came for the homecoming. Let me ask you, what will you be doing by the time you're 92? I hope you're still enjoying life. I hope there's still a lot of motor development in you left so that you can enjoy life thoroughly and um, safely and healthily.